deal with these people is found in the book A Critical Study of Shirk by Sheikh Muhammad bin Abdul Wahab. And I, if you want the answer in full, you need to go through this book from beginning to end. It's called A Critical Study of Shirk and it's published by Al-Hidayah. But I'm going to give you the summary, the Zulfa. Okay? The essence is this, guys. You know that the Quran doesn't contradict itself. Happy? No contradictions in the Quran. And you know that the Sunnah of the Prophet وسلم, does not contradict itself. It's only a revelation that is revealed. And you know that the Quran does not contradict the authentic Sunnah, and the authentic Sunnah does not contradict the Quran. Everyone with me so far? Tayyip. You know that Allah has told you that in the Quran, in Surah Al Imran, ayah number 8, ayah number 7, I'm quoting off the top of my head, that there are ayat which are crystal clear, and there are ayat which need uh, some sort of assistance in explaining. And that the people who are upon the truth, they take their understanding from the clear ayat of the Quran, and they don't follow the unclear. Happy with that? The Quran has ayat that are clear, simple to understand, and it has ayat that are less easy to understand. The people of the Sunnah, what ayah number seven? Seven, ayah number seven, Surah al -Imran. So Surah number three, ayah number seven. And they follow the people, so the people who are upon the truth, they follow the clear meanings of the Quran, and the people who are upon falsehood, they follow the unclear meanings of the Quran. Okay? Simple, no problem. Right. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in, let's say 15 places in the Quran, don't make dua to other than Allah. 10 places, 15 places where Allah uses outright clear language. Do not make dua to other than Allah. Example, Surah Al-Jinn. وَأَنَّ الْمَسَاجِدَ لِلَّهِ فَلَا تَجْعُوا مَعَ اللَّهِ أَحَدًا Surah Al-Jinn. The masajid, the mosques, belong to Allah, so do not make dua to anybody besides Allah. Okay, no problem. Someone comes to you and says, it's permissible to make dua to other than Allah because of a hadith where the Prophet ﷺ did such and such. What are you going to say to him? The first thing I want you to understand, Ya Ikhwani, is that you don't need to have the answer. This is critical for you to understand. You don't need the answer. You only need to know the truth. Okay? You only need to know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, his speech does not contradict, the Prophet's speech does not contradict, and you know that Allah has commanded you to follow what is clear from the Quran, and the Quran says don't make dua to anyone other than Allah. That's all you need. So you say to him, so and so, I don't know about this hadith you're telling me about. I have no idea what hadith you're talking about. And I have no idea whether it's authentic or not. But I know from the clear evidence of the Quran that it's impermissible to make dua to other than Allah. And I know the Quran doesn't contradict itself. So whatever you're saying, I don't know if you've twisted a word, mistranslated, give weak hadith, you know, just invented it, lying, whatever you're doing, I don't know. But I do know that it's not permissible to make dua to other than Allah because the Quran tells us in the clear text of the Quran 10, 12, 13, 15 times, do not make dua to other than Allah. That's all you need. Then later on, you can go back to his hadith and you can study it and you can see, all right, it was weak. Or you can see that he misinterpreted it. Or you can see that he lied. The hadith doesn't exist or that he twisted the meaning. That's fine. But in the first instance, when you debate against them, you don't need to know the answer. And this is what Muhammad bin Abdul Wahab says in Kashf al Shubahat, in the Critical Study of Shaykh. You don't need the answer. You only need to know your own belief. And to know that your own belief is clearly evidenced from the Quran and the Sunnah. And to know the Quran and the Sunnah does not contradict itself. So someone comes to you and says, it's permissible to build over the graves, tombs, because of an ayah in Surah Al-Kahf. You haven't memorized Surah Al-Kahf, okay? 
You don't know the ayah. What do you say to him? You say the Prophet wasallam said, do not build over the graves. And the Prophet wasallam commanded that the graves be flattened to, uh, you know, the, the, the height of, uh, like, the, like uh, I don't know what it is, but small, like a short sort of a hand span, uh, arm span sort of thing, forearm span, a very small height. And the Prophet sent Ali to flatten the graves. I know this. I have no idea what ayah you're talking about in Surah Al-Kahf, and to be quite honest, I don't care. Because the Quran does not contradict itself, and the Sunnah does not contradict itself, and the Quran does not contradict the Sunnah, and the Quran and the Sunnah tell us not to build over the graves, so I don't know what you're talking about, but I'm certain, O oh enemy of Allah, that this is not the truth. Simple. Then later on you go to Surah Al-Kahf, you look up the ayah, you find out that the ayah is revealed regarding the disbelievers who built over the graves, not the believers who did so. And that's fine, you can go back to them and say, actually, I've got a proof. But don't think this is going to silence him. He'll say, no, 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 my sheikh had a dream, and in that dream the Prophet ﷺ came to him and he told him you can build over the graves. He said, Laka, can he take, you take, you know, that's for you and for your sheikh. No problem, inshallah. You do what you want. But me, I follow muhkam at tanzil. I follow the clear ayat of the Quran. They tell us not to do it. And don't think you know, subhanAllah, that you will stop. He will just keep going and going and going. No, 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 I'll bring you an evidence. A hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, the Prophet ﷺ said, build over the graves. You say, okay, no problem. I don't know what this hadith is. But again, I know for certain the Prophet ﷺ commanded us not to do so. And this is in Sahih Bukhari and Muslim. And I know this for certain. So I know that whatever your hadith is, it's not going to be right, no matter what. I don't need to know the specifics. And then you go and you find, bring me a chain of your hadith. He said, ah, a chain? Yeah, right. We don't actually have a chain because this was revealed in a book that my sheikh inherited from his grandfather. And, uh, you know, his grandfather received it by means of wahi. He said, Alhamdulillah. Most of them, they have no aql. They have no intellect. So we say, you know, subhanAllah, you know, you can keep your granddad's dreams. Alhamdulillah. That's no problem. But me, I worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. So the answer is you don't need to know the details of every single thing. You only need to know that your deen, your aqidah is correct. Your aqidah has evidence from the Quran and the Sunnah. And you know the Quran so it doesn't contradict itself. So say to him, ah, we will keep talking, whatever you want. And I, I do recommend, yani, you know, if you do have some time, don't buy the book because we don't want to sort of give any money to these guys. But yani, flip through the book, Ja al Haq, the book of the Brayweeder, Ja al Haq. And this book is an evil, evil book. But subhanAllah, one of the things the authors did, he did some insaf. You know, subhanAllah, he did a bit of justice. And one of the things he did in his book, Ja al Haq, is he mentions the Dalil of what he calls the enemies or the delil of the, the, you know, the Wahhabis or whatever it is. And wallahi, read it, subhanAllah, there is nothing that will increase your iman like this. His page where he mentions his delil, wallahi, you can't find a hadith and not an ayah. Go through that, you can't go through it with a tooth comb, you'll find one ayah in the book or two ayat in the book, the delil of the Wahhabis, ayah, 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 Bukhari, Muslim, Bukhari, Muslim. And then he will say, you know, uh, these were, you know, it's, like he says, building over the graves. The chapter, and he goes on about building over the graves. No ayat, no hadith. Maybe he mentions the ayat in Surah Al-Kahf. Then he says, the Dalil of the Wahhabis. And then he says, the Prophet Sallallahu said, don't build over the graves, Bukhari, Muslim. The Prophet Sallallahu said, Ali to destroy the graves, Bukhari, Muslim. Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala said, and the ayat, ayat, hadith, hadith, hadith. We say, SubhanAllah. This is a book that SubhanAllah he wrote to prove that our belief is wrong. And yet it is all of our belief is based upon the ayat and the ahadith, according to his own admission. And all of his belief is based on his dreams and his shaykh's dreams. And what he found in the books of Sihr and the books of, you know, magic and the books of Kufr and the belief of the Christians and the Jews. SubhanAllah. And he said, this is what you bring against the Quran and the Sunnah. Alhamdulillah. And he will say afterwards, you know, some foolish people believe that the Prophet ﷺ, when he said, don't make dua to other than Allah, that he meant don't make dua to other than Allah. But the people of the tariqah, they know that when the Prophet ﷺ said, don't make dua to other than Allah, the secret message was, you should make dua to other than Allah. Say, Alhamdulillah, you can keep your secret message. You and the people who follow you. 
لَكُمْ دِينُكُمْ وَلِيَدِينُ You have your religion and I have my religion. So the point is that you don't need to know the details of their belief. You can get those details later on. What you need is you need to know your belief and be certain that your belief is right. And if you go through a critical study of shirk, there is this, the shaykh explains this in detail and he goes through many of their arguments and he refutes them, alhamdulillah. First, in generally, and then in detail, but it's worth, uh, inshallah, reading. Right, very, very quick, because we are short on time. I said, well, we can always delay some to next week. Fine. Al Inqiyad, conditions of La ilaha illallah. Al Inqiyad, you have to submit to Allah and His laws. So Al Inqiyad, oh sorry, we had Al Qabul, my mistake. We had Al Qabul. Al Qabul is acceptance. You know, we say Qabul like when someone gets married and they say Qabil to Qabul, you know, I've accepted. Qabul means acceptance. You have to accept what La ilaha illallah entails. You have to accept that La ilaha illallah means that you have to stop worshipping other than Allah and worship Allah alone. Indeed, they, when it was said to them, there is no deity, again, true deity but Allah. This is just the Sahih International Translation. Were arrogant and were saying, are we to leave our gods for a mad poet? So in the ayah, we see that the people are not willing to accept what la ilaha illallah entails. So when it is said to them la ilaha illallah, what do they reply? We're not going to leave our gods. So they understand la ilaha illallah. They don't have a problem with understanding it. They don't have a problem with their certainty. It's not that they doubt whether it's true or not. Their problem is that they're not willing to accept what la ilaha illallah entails. They're not willing to leave their gods. So that you must be willing to leave the worship of other than Allah and to worship Allah. Tarim. Number four, al-inqiyad, submission. You know, part of Islam is, what, what's the meaning of Islam? The meaning of Islam isn't peace, as it's mistranslated. The meaning of Islam is al-istislam, submission. So al-inqiyad, al-istislam, this is the meaning of Islam. So you submit to Allah and His laws. And the opposite is that you abandon Allah and His laws. So you're part of la ilaha illallah. Again, Allah says, and return in repentance to your Lord and submit to Him. So part of la ilaha illallah is you have to be willing to submit yourself to Allah. And that's similar to Qabul in a way. But Qabul is that you accept that la ilaha illallah means that you leave the gods. And the submission is that you submit yourself to Allah and to the laws of Islam. You become a Muslim. That you don't just say, right, I know Allah ilaha illallah means I've stopped worshipping my gods uh, and I, you know, I'm certain, but I still, I'm not a Muslim. Part of, you know, of this is al-inqiyad, al-islam. You have to actually submit to Allah as a Muslim. To for la ilaha illallah to be true. And that would seem, you know, you may find Christians saying la ilaha illallah. You know, you may find different sects saying la ilaha illallah. Their problem is they don't do inqiyad. So they haven't submitted to Allah in Islam. Number five, a sidq truthfulness. And this is the opposite of lying. You have to be truthful in what you say. Not like the munafiqeen. Because the munafiqeen said la ilaha illallah. They said, we know what it means, we're certain, we've submitted in Islam, we've accepted that it means we have to leave our gods. But they weren't being truthful. They were lying when they said it. So the hypocrites were lying when they, when they said it. وَمِنَ النَّاسِ مَنْ يَقُولُوا آمَنَّا بِاللَّهِ وَالْيَوْمِ الْآخِرِ وَمَا هُمْ بِمُؤْمِنِينَ From the people are those who say we believe in Allah in the last day, but they are not believers. Um, this is repeated twice, it should be the second part of the ayah. Mm. Okay, on the piece of paper, the word hypocrite seems to be cut off, so you might need to fill in the word. Not like uh, hypocrites. La bas, inshallah, you can, you can fill it in. <laughs> Number six, al ikhlas. And al ikhlas means you do your actions, your worship of Allah with the right intention. For Allah alone, not for your parents, not for anyone else. You don't say la ilaha illallah. And this is different to a sidq, because in a sidq, the person is lying about la ilaha illallah. When the ikhlas is the problem, the person's not lying, but they're not sincere. They don't really want it for the sake of Allah. It's not about, about 
worshiping Allah for his sake. It's about making mom and dad happy. It's about, you know, fitting in with the community. That doesn't make you a Muslim until you are sincere for Allah alone. And they were not commanded except to worship Allah, being sincere to him in the religion, inclining to truth and to give the prayer and to, and to establish the prayer and give the zakah. And this is the correct, correct religion. So sincere to him in the religion. And the seventh is Al-Mahabba. Notice Al-Mahabba is spelled with a, a tam or water at the end. But in the poem, it's spelled with a ha. And that's what we call the Lord of the that you need to take the ta off in the poem for the poem to rhyme. The poem doesn't rhyme properly unless you take the ta off. So that's why if you look here, there's no dots above the ta because it's what's called a poetic necessity. You have to take the ta off, whereas uh, the proper way you write it is with the ta here, mahabba. And mahabba is love. And that is that you have to love Allah with, only, with the love that only He deserves. And again, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and from the people of those who take other than Allah as equals to him, they love them as they love Allah, but those who believe are stronger in love for Allah. And again, Ibn al-Qayyim, he mentions the love of Allah, and he says, love is of different types. There is the love of passion between a man and wife. There is the love of paternity between a father, or maternity between a father and a mother and their child. There is the love of you know, the child to the parents, there's the love you have, the brotherly love, sisterly love. But the most complete love is the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it's not like the mutasawwif I say, the Sufis say ishq. They say ishq al nabi and they say ishq Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ishq is what is between husband and wife. Ishq is love that is with passion and almost it leads you to insanity. You know, you go crazy out of love. And this ishq is not how we describe Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala never describes his love or the love of the Prophet ﷺ with ishq. But he describes it with mahabba. And mahabba is the love that you have, the love that is for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the love that only Allah deserves. Tayyip. What is worship? Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah ta'ala said, Ismun jami' لِكُلِّ مَا يُحِبُّهُ اللَّهُ وَيَرْضَاهُ مِنَ الْأَقْوَالِ وَالْأَفْعَالِ الظَّاهِرَةِ وَالْبَاطِنَةِ Worship is a comprehensive term. Yani it covers lots and lots and lots of things. Not just sajda, not just dua. It covers lots and lots of things. For everything that Allah loves and is pleased with, whether that is statements or actions, ظَاهِرَةً hidden, ظَاهِرَةً apparent or hidden. Okay, hidden or apart, apparent or hidden. Now what does it mean statements and actions apparent or hidden? Hidden are those things that are in your heart. And the heart has actions. There are actions of the heart and statements of the heart. There are things that your heart says, believes, you know, you keep in your heart. There are things that your heart does like fear, love, like, uh, you know, to hope in Allah, like to, you know, hope for Allah's mercy. This is an action of the heart. And there are statements of the heart. Like saying La ilaha illallah and holding that belief in your heart. And there are statements of the tongue uh, and, and there are actions of the limbs. So all of these things, whether it's something internal or external, whether it is something that you say or something that you do, if Allah loves and is pleased with it, it is an act of worship. Okay, different types of worship and the evidence for each. Okay, we have dua. وَقَالَ رَبُّكُمُ دُعُونِ أَسْتَجِبْ لَكُمْ إِنَّ الَّذِينَ يَسْتَكْبِرُونَ عَنْ عِبَادَتِي سَيَدْخُرُونَ جَهَنَّمَ دَاخِرِينَ And your Lord says, call upon me, I will respond to you. Indeed, those who disdain, like those who turn away from my worship, will enter Jahannam disgraced. Contempt contemptible and disgraced. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will disgrace them in Jahannam. Now notice, where is the evidence that dua is worship? Notice the word, my worship, and notice the word, call upon me. And I want you to underline, or to circle, call upon me, and then to circle, my worship. It's very, very, very clear from the ayah that the worship that Allah is talking about is the dua that he mentioned. Make, call upon me, if you want to, if you want to write the you know, to make that clear, call upon me, the word used in Arabic is make dua. Udruni, make dua to me. 
So if you wanted to change call upon me, you could just write above it, make dua to me, Badrun, that's the word in Arabic. Your Lord says, make dua to me, I will respond to you. Indeed, those who turn away from my worship, i.e. they turn away from my dua. So Allah makes dua and worship here synonymous. He makes the two the same. He doesn't differentiate between dua and worship. Who turns away from my dua has turned away from my worship. Love. And from those are those who take uh, other than Allah's equals to him. They love them as they should love Allah. But those who believe are stronger in love for Allah. It's clear here that love is the, one of the greatest forms of worship that you can do to get close to Allah. Fear. Have you not seen those who at all restrain your hands from fighting and establish prayer and give zakah? But when fighting was ordained for them, at once a party of them feared men or as they fear Allah or with an even greater fear. And then at the end, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, the enjoyment of this world is little and the hereafter is better for he who fears Allah. So again, this ayah is very, very clear in showing you that fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is from the greatest acts of worship that a Muslim can do. Prayer and sacrifice, say indeed my prayer, my sacrifice, my living and my dying or for Allah, Lord of the worlds. So again here we have evidence and these are just a few. And if you go back to Thalafat al-Usul, the three fundamental principles, this book which I also made, um, I can't to you guys, I made it, I recommended reading, the three fundamental principles by Sheikh Muhammad Abdul Wahab Rahimahullah. And this one we said is published by Al-Hidayah, the three fundamental principles. You will find more evidence than this and more acts of worship than this, inshallah, with the evidence is for them. Tayyip, now we come to join all this together and to sort of summarize what we've learned so far. We talked about the beliefs of Quraysh in the light of the meaning of La ilaha illallah and the impact of this on the Muslim world today. So we're just going to have a little discussion about this. The Muslim world today, and I think we're going to, we're going to probably skip most of it because we need to get through this material very quickly. But we have talked about the fact that most of the Muslim world today, or a large part of the Muslim world today, have fallen into making partners with Allah, and they are using the same justification that Quraysh used. So if you understand what has preceded about the meaning of La ilaha illallah, about what worship is, about Quraysh and what they used to do, about the fact that Allah called them disbelievers even though they believed in Allah as a creator, sustainer, provider, if you understand this, then you are able to respond to those people today who use this as a justification for, uh, for uh, what they do. Tayyip, responding to those who call upon other than Allah. So you find a person standing by the grave of the Prophet وسلم, saying, O Messenger of Allah, save me. O Messenger of Allah, answer my prayer. How do you convince him that this is worshipping other than Allah? What might he respond with? And how might you reply to those responses? And what if you don't know the answer to something that he says? Most of this we have covered already. So you're going to begin by trying to take him step by step. It's very important. And again, you can return back to a, a, a critical study of shirk for a detailed explanation. You're going to take him step by step. You're going to say, Ya Akhil do you agree with me that worship is only for Allah. If he says no, it's permissible to worship other than Allah, then the first thing you need to do is to convince him that worship itself is only for Allah. Okay? So, you, let's say, if he says, no, you can worship whoever you want, then this is someone who hasn't entered into Islam in the first place. So we can talk to him about worship, about la ilaha illallah, about the fact that uh, that, that you need to, that it, about Quraysh and so on and so forth. But more likely, he's going to say, this person by the grave, totally, I totally agree with you, worship is only for Allah. What I'm doing is not worship. So the next thing you're going to say is, Ya Akhi, do you agree with me that dua is the greatest form of worship? Or that dua is a major form of worship? So again, they're going to say, well, uh, it depends, but no, yes or no, is dua worship or not worship? 
So again, if he says no, you're going to go through all of the dalil. The dua is worship. A dua of nukhul ibadah, the dua is the, is, the, is, the, is the essence of ibadah that the, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, indeed those who turn away from my worship will enter Jahannam in disgrace, and so on and so forth. So let's say he says now, do you have agreed? Okay, you've agreed that we're going, that you have to worship Allah alone. And you've agreed that dua is worship. But I'm finding you standing here making dua to other than Allah. What's he likely to say? He's likely to come up with the, the argument that I'm not making dua to other than Allah. Yes, I agree with you that worship is only for Allah. Yes, I agree with you that dua is worship. But I'm not making dua to other than Allah. What I'm doing is I'm using a wasila, a tawassul. I'm coming near to Allah by the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. You say, first of all, this statement, O Messenger of Allah, save me, doesn't sound very much like you're coming near to Allah. It sounds to me like you're asking the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He said, no, no, that's not what I intend. My niyyah is, I'm asking the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to save me by asking Allah to save me. Say, okay, oh, that was. So you talk to him then about the issue of tawassul and how Quraysh used to seek nearness to Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala by worshipping the idols and about how Allah called them kabir and kafar, liars and disbelievers and so on and so forth. So you have again a method and eventually inshallah if the person is sincere then he will change inshallah ta'ala and if he is not sincere then you have done your job of presenting the message What if you don't know the answer to something that he says? Again we said, if he says no one writes tawassul because there is a hadith in of Ibn Umar, that Ibn Umar came to the grave of the Prophet Sallallahu and said, O oh, Messenger of Allah, save me. Say no problem. Again, what we said, we don't need to know the hadith. We, we know for certain it's going to be wrong because we know that the, we know our own belief and we know that it's firmly grounded and we know the Quran doesn't contradict itself. So we say, yeah, I know the Quran doesn't contradict itself. I know the Sunnah doesn't contradict itself. The Quran says, the Sunnah says, therefore this hadith of Ibn Umar, I will be careful and go and check it and actually make sure it's true. No, no, it's got to be true because my Shaykh says that it's true. Then you can deal with the Shaykh. Bit by bit. Don't get them in one conversation. Step by step. Worship, dua, then the issue of tawassul, then the issue of a Shaykh, then the issue of dreams, or whatever it is, until you, he's forced to say, yes, I agree, or at least you... Uh, you know, establish the proof against him. Tayyip. We're going to have to go quickly. Tawheed. The reason I delayed Tawheed to hear and not mention it in the introduction is I wanted to mention Tawheed after we had talked about La ilaha illallah. So that people are not blinded by the word Tawheed. Because sometimes you might have someone who's been listening to these guys and the word Tawheed itself is a problem for them. And they come and they're like, no, 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 I can't accept it. You know, like, this word, Tawheed, no, no, no way. You know, like, I, I, you know, Tawheed, this is the belief of the Wahhabi, this is the, the Wahhabi belief, this is the evil belief, this is the Shaitan, this is Iblis. Like, and the word Tawheed stops them from understanding. You don't need to use the word Tawheed. But we're going to define the word Tawheed now after La ilaha illallah. Nobody's going to fight you if you say, Ya Akhi, let me talk to you about La ilaha illallah. But if you say, I'm going to talk about Tawheed, oh, all right, Tawheed, yeah, I've heard your Tawheed before. You know? So you need to sort of sometimes delay the talk of Tawheed until after you've explained that ilaha illallah. So linguistically, Tawheed is a verbal noun from the verb wahhadi, wahidu, meaning to unify or to declare something to be one or to make something one. Islamically, Tawheed is to affirm the oneness of Allah in his lordship, which we call Tawheed, al rububiyyah We also call it Tawheed. Al Ma'rifati Wal Ithbat, and we also call it Al Tawheed Al Ilmi. There are lots of names, I picked three for you. We call it Tawheed Al Rububiyyah. Rububiyyah comes from the word Rabb. The Tawheed that Allah is the only Rabb. The Tawheed that Allah is the only Rabb. That's what Rububiyyah means, that Allah is the only Rabb. Okay? We also call it Tawheed Al Ma'rifati Wal Ithbat, the Tawheed of knowledge and affirmation. Why? Because this type of affirming that Allah is the only Rabb, this is all about what you know about Allah and what you believe about Allah. It's not about what you do. 
It's got none of your actions in it. It's not about your prayer, it's not about your dua. It's about believing that Allah Azza wa Jal is the only one who has the attributes of Lordship. The only Lord, the only sustainer, provider, creator, the only one who brings life and causes death. So you're talking about that Allah is the only Lord. And that's why it's called Tawheed al Ma'rifati wal Ithbat. The Tawheed of knowledge and affirmation. Because it's all about knowing Allah and affirming that Allah is the only one who has these characteristics. Okay? It's also called a Tawheed al ilmi knowledge Tawheed, or knowledge based Tawheed. And a Tawheed al ilmi is because this Tawheed is all based upon what you know. It's not based upon what you do, it's based upon what you know. And this is the Tawheed that is referred to in the statement of Allah Azza wa Jal. Allahu ladhi khalaqa sab'a samawatin wa min al-abdi mithlahun yatadabbaru al-amra baynahunna li ta'lamu anna allaha ala kulli shayin qadir wa anna allaha qada ahata bi kulli shayin ayin. That Allah who created the seven heavens and from the earth, seven earths, He controls the affair, the matters that happen within them, so that you may know that Allah is able to do all things and you may know that Allah has surrounded everything with His knowledge. This is all to do with a tawheed al ilmi, so that you know an ilmi, so that you know. Okay? So this is uh, the ayah. That Allah who created the seven heavens and from the earths like them, yet that He controls the affair between them, so that you may know that Allah is able to do all things. The next uh, meaning of, or the, the, the next uh, part of Tawheed is the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and this is called Tawheed al Uluhiyyah. And the word Uluhiyyah comes from the word Ilah. We did the word Ilah before, yeah? The word Ilah. Uluhiyyah comes from the word ilah. So the tawheed that Allah is the only ilah. Yeah, uluhiyyah. It's also called tawheed al-qasdi wa talab. The tawheed of intention and the tawheed of seeking or asking. Yeah, seeking or asking. And it's also called action tawheed. At tawheed al-amali. The tawheed of action. Okay, so it's called the Tawheed of Allah's worship, that Allah is the only one that deserves to be worshipped. Al-Qasd wa talab the intention of seeking because it's about your intention when you worship, that you worship Allah alone. It's about your dua when you make it, that you make it to Allah alone. It's about when you make sajda, that your sajda is for Allah alone. So that's why it's called the Tawheed of intention and seeking. And it's called action Tawheed. Because it is, it, it's all relating to your actions and what you do. That's why it's called al-Tawheed al-Amali. And this is the Tawheed that is mentioned by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at the end of Surah Al-Dhariyat. وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ I have only created the jinn and the mankind to worship me alone. Another way to understand this, which sometimes is easier for people to grasp, is that Tawheed is two types. Tawheed that relates to the actions of Allah, that Allah is the only one that provides, creates, sustains, Allah is the only one uh, who sends down the rain, Allah is the only one who brings life and death, Allah is as samad Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is al rahman al-Rahim, al-Malik, al quddus Allah's actions. And a Tawheed that relates to our actions. That the actions we do, we do for Allah alone. Okay? So have we understood this? That you can either cast Tawheed into three, or you can cast Tawheed into two. Okay? Now there's two points that I want to make that are not in the notes. That I want to make here. And I will try and make some space for the notes as well. For next time. Two points that I want you to make. Uh, the first is... Where did the third category go? We have Lordship, we have Worship, and we have names and attributes. Tawheed al Asma al Sifat. It's actually mentioned, actually, I have mentioned it in the notes, I mentioned it here, 
the Tawheed al asma al Sifat, the Tawheed of Allah's names and attributes, that Allah is the only one who has those names and attributes, that is part of Lordship. Okay? So that is part of Lordship. So if you look at Tawheed as two types, then you're looking at it as Lordship and Worship. If you look at Tawheed as three types, you can separate the names and attributes from Lordship. It's entirely up to you. It makes no difference at all. Whether you divide it into three or whether you divide it into two, it makes no difference at all. Because names and attributes are a part of Lordship. Okay, someone says, Muhammad, why or oh why? Then did you mention names and attributes separately? Why didn't you just say Lordship and Worship? That's because some of the scholars of Islam divided Tawheed into three things, Allah's Lordship, Worship and Names, and some divided it into Lordship and Worship. Okay? And the reason they mentioned the names is the names and attributes became very important later on when people started to deviate and be misguided in the names and attributes. So the ulama, to be clear, the scholars of Islam, they emphasize this by making a third category because those people said, those people who were misguided in Allah's names and attributes, they said, we are people of Tawheed. The scholars said, no, you're not people of Tawheed. They said, yes, we are because we believe in Allah's Lordship and worship. They said, yeah, but you don't believe in his names and attributes. They said, yeah, but that's not included. So what they did is to make it clear, they made a third category called names and attributes, which is, if you think of it, you can think of it as part of lordship, or you can think of it as three separate categories. It doesn't make any difference. But broadly, you can summarize it in Allah's actions, which is his lordship and his names and his attributes, and our actions towards him, which is the worship. Type. The point I want to make here is, and I'll just briefly make a note of it, we just ask ourselves a question, what were the prophets sent for? Or which Tawheed, let's make it more clear, which Tawheed were the prophets sent for? That's one point. And the second question we're going to ask ourselves is, what is the relationship between Lordship and Worship? Okay? What is the difference between Lordship or the relationship between Lordship and Worship? Okay? So, what Tawheed were the Prophets sent for? Everyone should be clear. The Prophets were sent to call the people to Tawheed and Uluhiyyah. What's the evidence for this? We've already learned the evidence. Someone says to you, what's the evidence for this? Without an ayah. We're going to say, Quraysh already believed in Tawheed al rububiyyah They believed that Allah was the Lord, sustainer, creator, provider. Their problem was in worshipping Him. Is that strictly true that Quraysh believed in Tawheed al rububiyyah as a side note? It's worth noting that Quraysh, even in Tawheed al rububiyyah they still, yani they had one or two issues. For example, وَإِذَا قِيلَ لَهُمْ If it's said to them, we'll make sujood to Ar-Rahman, they said, وَمَا Rahman. Who is Ar-Rahman? What is this a mistake in? Which Tawheed? Who can answer me? When the Quraysh were asked, when, they, when it is said to them, make sajda to Ar-Rahman, they said, who is Ar-Rahman? Asma al Sifat, or if we count two Tawheed, if we only divide Tawheed into two? Rububiyyah. Okay? So even though we say Quraysh broadly in Rububiyyah uh, were, were believed in Rububiyyah completely, yeah, there, there were some small, little, little things. But in general, the Quraysh in general, they believed in Tawheed and Rububiyyah almost, almost completely. Their problem was at Tawheed al Amali. That their own actions was the problem, not their belief about Allah, but their own actions towards Allah. Okay? And what is the relationship between Lordship and Worship? Allah gives two seemingly, and I use the word seemingly, contradictory reasons for the creation of the earth. In one, Allah says the earth was created for you to know Allah. And in the other, Allah says that we were created to worship Him. 
Yes, you can argue that's for the earth and that, that's for the, you know, that's for us, but the, the ayah about the earth mentions us as well. So the earth and everything in it, including us, were created to know Allah, and in another ayah were created to worship Allah. We know the Quran doesn't contradict itself. So what's the understanding? In this you need to understand the relationship between Lordship and Worship. Okay? Lordship leads a person or necessitates worship. Lordship necessitates worship. In other words, once you know that Allah is your Lord and sustainer and creator and provider, the only one who harms, the only one who benefits, why would you worship anything else? So Lordship leads you or compels you or forces you to worship. Anyone who believes properly 100% in the Lordship of Allah as it should be, it's impossible that they would not worship Allah. And this is why we say Quraysh's belief in Lordship can't have been 100% right. Because if your belief in Lordship is 100% right, why would you worship anything else? No doubt. Yeah, I mean, there, there, there are reasons they say, you know, intercession or whatever. But the point here is that Lordship in any sane person, when they believe Allah is the only one who harms and benefits, it should force them to make dua to Allah alone. Okay, because you accept that everything other than Allah can't help you or benefit. So the mean, these two ayat are the same. It's as though Allah is saying, I created you to know me and so to worship me. And when you worship Allah, you worship Allah based on your knowledge of Him. Because you can't worship Allah until you know Him. You can't worship Allah until you know Him. So by worshiping Allah, it necessitates you have to know Allah. Because you can't worship what you don't know. So what are you worshipping? I have no idea what I'm worshipping. No, it doesn't, you, when so you ask someone, what are you worshipping? This is my idol, this is my tree, this is my... What are you worshipping? I don't know. No, you have to know what it is that you worship. So if somebody says that they are worshipping Allah, that worship has to be based upon knowing Allah. Again, there are people who worship Allah, they don't know Him properly, and that's a flaw in their belief. But in general, worshipping Allah should be based upon knowing Him, and his Lordship, and the Lordship of Allah should compel you to worship him. So the two are linked together, and we only separate between them, first of all because the Quran does, and secondly because uh, we separate between them to show that there are people who claim to be people of Tawheed, but in reality they are people who are not fulfilling Tawheed in all of its different types. Okay, and that's why we separate. Someone asked the question last week, what is the, uh, our Aqidah is based upon Tawheed. And they said, what is the relationship between Aqidah and Tawheed? Our Aqidah is based upon Tawheed. And everything in Islam comes back to Tawheed. Happy? Aqidah is based upon Tawheed, and everything in Islam comes back to Tawheed. Therefore, it is true to say that our Aqidah is Tawheed. However, Aqidah is technically a larger topic than just the issue of worshipping Allah alone. Okay? When people say our Aqidah is Tawheed, they don't mean there's no issue in, in Aqidah that isn't Tawheed. What they mean is that our Aqidah is Tawheed, as in all of our Aqidah comes back to Tawheed, the most important thing is Tawheed, the essence is Tawheed, the beginning is Tawheed, the end is Tawheed, the middle is Tawheed. But yes, there are issues in our Aqidah that don't relate to Tawheed directly, but they all relate to Tawheed indirectly. So it's totally valid to say our Aqidah is Tawheed as a general statement, but we're aware that when we talk about Aqidah, we're not just going to be talking about pure Tawheed, but we're also going to be talking about indirect issues that relate to Tawheed, um, which are not directly related. For example, our beliefs about the companions or whatever it may be. Tayyip. Now we come on to our section on uh, the Arabic notes. And I don't think we're going to be able to cover shirk today, which is no problem. We'll, do, we'll cover shirk at the, at the beginning of next lesson, inshallah, because we still have a lot to cover on Tawheed. Uh, and we'll try to cover shirk, inshallah, at the beginning of next lesson. We'll see how much time we have, inshallah. 
Now, you don't have the Arabic notes with you guys. Uh, there was a lot of pages I gave to the brothers and sisters to print. Uh, so they weren't able to print them, you know, so many pages in time, and that was because I only sent it, you know, like today, uh, lunchtime. So what I'm going to do is show you them on the projector, and don't worry, the notes will be, inshallah, given to you for next week, inshallah. Okay, all of these notes are in Arabic. Okay? And I did that for a reason. First of all, because most of it is ayat of the Quran, and I really, we don't need to sort of sit and translate them all one by one for the benefit of just the class. Inshallah, you can take them in Arabic, you have the reference written for you, and you can look up the translation in English as a, like a homework or something, inshallah, it's no problem. Okay, and also because I wanted to give you the actual book. Okay, this is from the book of one of uh, my shuyuk, Shia Abdul Razak, Rabbi Marsan Abad. And this book is a book of a refutation of those people who criticized making Tawheed into categories. And they said that this making Tawheed into categories is a bid'ah that you people invented. You know, Imam Ahmed invented it, or Ibn Taymiyyah invented it, or Muhammad bin Abdul Wahab invented it. Somebody invented this idea of Tawheed al and Tawheed al and Tawheed al Asma al Sifat. The Shaykh, he says, this is ma'ulima bil istiqra. And an istiqra means if you go through the Quran, every ayah in the Quran, and you were to put all of the ayat into baskets about Tawheed, you would only at the end have three baskets. Rububiyya, Uluhiyya, Asma Sifat. Lordship, worship, names and attributes. There is no other category mentioned in the Quran. So what we're saying here, it's not a bid'ah, it's what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself in the Quran divided Tawheed up into. Okay, so the first thing we're going to look at are evidences for the Lordship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The first evidence the Shaykh gives, and if I can see this one, so no, it doesn't. Okay, the first thing I want you guys to look at is this. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen All praise is due to Allah, Lord of the worlds. What kind of Tawheed is this affirming? Rububiyya, the Lordship of Allah. Allah is the Lord of the worlds. And there is no Lord of the worlds other than Allah. Okay? Fine. Okay? Ala lahul khalqu wal amr Tabarakallahu Rabbul Alameen Indeed, Allah is the one who controls creation and He controls all of the affairs of the universe. So blessed is Allah, the Lord of the universe. Again, Lordship. Again, Say to them, who is the Lord of the heavens and the earth? Say Allah. قُلْ لِمَنِ الْأَرْضُ وَمَنْ فِيهَا إِنْ كُنْتُمْ تَعْلَمُونَ سَيَقُولُونَ لِلَّهِ قُلْ أَفَلَا قُلْ أَفَلَا تَذَكَّرُونَ قُلْ مَنْ رَبُّ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ قُلْ مَنْ رَبُّ السَّمَاوَاتِ السَّبْعِ وَرَبُّ الْعَرْشِ الْعَظِيمِ سَيَقُولُونَ اللَّهُ سَيَقُولُونَ لِلَّهِ قُلْ أَفَلَا تَتَّقُونَ قُلْ قُلْ مَنْ بِيَدِهِ مَلَكُوتُ مَلَكُوتُ كُلِّ شَيْءٍ وَهُوَ يُجِيرُ وَلَا يُجَارُ عَلَيْهِ إِنْ كُنْتُمْ تَعْلَمُونَ سَيَقُولُونَ لِلَّهِ قُلْ فَأَنَّا تُسْحَرُونَ Say to whom belongs the earth and everything that is in it if you, you, if you know. They will say all of them belong to Allah. Say then will you not, uh, will you not remember? They say who is the Lord of the, the seven heavens and the Lord of the great throne? They will say these seven heavens and the great throne belongs to Allah. Say will you not fear him? Say, who, had, who controls the, the dominion of every single thing? And he is the one who uh, protects you and nobody protects you against him. If you do not, they will say, Allah, say, then why are you, yani, just how old? it's like, you are, why are you, you know, bewitched? Or you, you are, why are you deluded in this way? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, this is Allah your Lord, 
Blessed is your Lord, the Lord of the universe. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Allah khaliqu kulli shay, wa huwa ala kulli shay wakil. Allah is the creator of everything, and he is a, and he is uh, a wakil over everything. Uh, and that he is appointed to be responsible or trustee over everything. And there are many, many, many other ayat. You can see that these ayat, they are very clear talking about Tawheed al rububi Not talking about anything else so far. Just Tawheed al rububi on their own. So that's one kind of Tawheed. Now we come to some more ayat. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Alhamdulillah. Okay? Allah, the word Allah, what does it mean? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who is worshipped and no one is worshipped but Him. You alone we worship and you alone we ask for help. So, this is worship of Allah. Our worship of Allah alone and not worship anyone but Him. So, this goes into Tawheed al Uluhi, Tawheed al Amal. Ya ayyuhal nas, u'budu rabbakum alladhi khalaqakum wa alladhina min qablikum la'allakum tattakun O you, my all mankind, worship your Lord who created you and created those who came before you so that you may be from those who fear Allah. Again, worship. Now, there is also lordship in there. Worship your Lord. And that shows you the link between lordship and worship, right? Worship your Lord. I.e. because Allah is your Lord, that should compel you to worship Him. So in there you have the link between worship and between Lordship. Worship Allah making the religion for Him alone. Indeed the pure religion is for Allah alone. وَالَّذِينَ اتَّخَذُوا مِن دُونِهِ أَوْلِيَاءَ مَا نَعْبُدُهُمْ إِلَّا لِيُخَرِّبُونَ إِلَى اللَّهِ زُلْفَى And those who took awliya besides Allah, look at the word Allah uses, awliya, they took a wali besides Allah. As believers, we don't take walis besides Allah. They say we only worship them to make us near to Allah. And Allah says, قُلِ اللَّهَ أَعْبُدُ مُخْلِصًا لَهُ دِينِي Say that, I worship Allah making the religion for him alone. So worship whatever you like, but I'm going to worship Allah. They were only commanded to worship him, to worship Allah and to make the religion for Him alone. So you can translate these inshallah at home. But you see that each of them is relating to worshipping Allah, worshipping Allah, don't worship other than Allah. So we see in some ayat, in some ayat, Allah talks about him being the Lord. And in some ayat, Allah talks about him being the one who deserves to be worshipped. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim. Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim. Maliki Yawm din This is talking about Allah's names and attributes. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Qul idru Allah ha widru Ar-Rahman ayyamma tad'u falahu al-asma'u al-husna. Say, call upon Allah or call upon Ar-Rahman. Whichever one you call upon, Allah has all of the beautiful names, the most perfect and beautiful names. And Allah says, Hal ta'lamu lahu samiyya. Do you know anyone that is comparable to him? Names and attributes. And Allah says, La Allahu la ilaha illa hu lahu al-asma'u al-husna. There is no God worthy of worship except Allah. Allah has the most perfect names. This is an also one that joins between worship and lordship because the names are there and also worshipping Allah alone is also there. And Allah says, Laysa shay wa huwa samir basir. There is nothing like him and he is the all hearing, the all seeing. And Allah says, wa lam yakun lahu kufuwan ahad. There is nothing that is similar to him. So when you go through all of the ayat of the Quran, you find that these ayat that are talking about Tawheed, are either talking about Allah being the Lord, or Allah being the one that deserves to be worshipped, or Allah having his perfect names and attributes and nobody else having them but him. So this is not a bid'ah that was invented by Muhammad bin Abdul Wahhab or by anybody else. This was found in the Quran. The Quran itself only talks about these three things. Lord, worship, names and attributes. Now we want to look at some of the ayat 
that join all of the names and attributes together, all of the types of Tawheed together in one ayah. So these ayat are the ones that join together all of the types of Tawheed in one ayah. From those are ayat al kursi Allahu la ilaha illa huwa al-hayyul qayyum. La ta'khuduhu sinatun wa la nawm. Lahu ma fi samawati wa ma fi al-ard. And we're going to go through this bit by bit. So, Allahu la ilaha illa hu. There's no God worthy of worship except Allah. What is this? Where would you put this one? Which box would you put this one into? Uluhiyya, primarily. Any yeah, it comprises all of them, but primarily Uluhiyya. There's a name of Allah in there, and it comprises Allah's Lordship, but primarily, let's say, La ilaha illallah, we're going to put it into Uluhiyya. And Hayyu Qayyu. Asma'u Sifat. La ta'khuduhu sinatun wa la nawm. He isn't overtaken by slumber or sleep. You can put it under attributes because it's a, it's a negative, because we believe as Ahl Sunnah that when you have a negative attribute, we affirm the positive. So just like we affirm Allah doesn't sleep, we, we affirm that Allah has the most perfect form of life. You can also put it under Rubiya, in essence, that it's part of the Lordship of Allah, that He doesn't slumber or sleep. لَهُ مَا فِي السَّمَاوَاتِ وَمَا فِي الْأَرْضِ He has whatever is in the heavens and whatever is in the earth. Lordship. مَنْ ذَلَّذِ يَشْفَعُ عِنْدَهُ إِلَّا بِإِذْنِهِ Who is it that can intercede with him except with his permission? Lordship. Jayyid. يَعْلَمُ مَا بَيْنَ أَيْدِيهِمْ وَمَا خَلْفَهُمْ وَلَا يُحِيطُونَ بِشَيْءٍ مِنْ عِلْمِهِ إِلَّا بِمَا شَاءَ Nobody can encompass his knowledge except him. He knows everything. Lordship. And you have also Asma Sifat, in, in a way you have the sense that Allah knows everything. So you have some Asma Sifat, and of course Asma Sifat is part of Lordship. But primarily you have Lordship, nobody can interfere with him, nobody can encompass his knowledge. His, his throne encompasses the heavens and the earth, and it's not hard for him to protect them or, or, or to uh, guard them. Then out there again, you've got the Lordship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that Allah is the Lord, He guards over the heavens and the earth, and that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the Lord of the mighty throne. وَهُوَ الْعَلِيُّ الْعَظِيمُ وَهُوَ الْعَلِيُّ الْعَظِيمُ أَسْمَاءُ سِفَاتِ Okay, so you see Ayat al-Kursi is just one giant big lump of Tawheed, from beginning to end, the greatest Ayat in the Book of Allah Azza wa Jal. And it is Tawheed from beginning to end. All of the different types of Tawheed are found within it. Let's go through to another ayah. Say, do you worship besides Allah that which does not have any uh, any, uh, does not cause you any harm or any benefit, and Allah is as Sameer Al Alim. So, again, here, do you worship besides Allah? We're talking about worship. That which does not benefit you or harm you is the Lord, the belief, the Lordship. The benefit and harm is only from Allah. Wahu as Sameer Alim names and attributes. Okay? Then you have the statement of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. ذَلِكُمُ اللَّهُ رَبُّكُمْ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا هُوْ خَالِقُ كُلِّ شَيْءٍ فَاعْبُدُوا وَهُوَ عَلَى كُلِّ شَيْءٍ وَكِيلٍ لَا تُدْرِكُهُ الْأَبْصَارُ وَهُوَ يُدْرِكُ الْأَبْصَارُ وَهُوَ اللَّطِيفُ الْخَبِيرُ Let's break this down. ذَلِكُمُ اللَّهُ رَبُّكُمْ This is Allah your Lord. What's this? Lordship and also you have a name and attribute. You have Allah in there. So you have a name and attribute. لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا هُوْ Worship. خَالِقُ كُلِّ شَيْءٍ The creator of everything. Lordship. فَعْبُدُوا Worship Him. Worship. وَهُوَ عَلَى كُلِّ شَيْءٍ وَكِيلٍ He is a, a, trustee, a trustee over everything, a wakil over everything. So we have an attribute and we have also Lordship that Allah is con in control of everything. لَا تُدْرِكُ الْأَبْصَارِ وَهُوَ يُرْكُ الْأَبْصَارِ Sight cannot encompass Him but He sees everything and He is al latif Al-Khabir and He is uh, al latif Al-Khabir. These are Asma'u Sifat. So again, we see another ayah that encompasses every single kind of Tawheed. 
You can carry on, this is a lot. Um, you can do this yourself at home, inshallah, and go through the translations and try to identify where you have Lordship, Worship, Lordship, Worship, or if you want to do the three Lordship, Worships, Names and Attributes. But I want to really focus upon one ayah for you. And this ayah, I don't know where I hear you. This is the ayah that I want to focus on. And I want you to four star this one if you can. This is Number 11, we want this one started, right? This is very important. So if you make a note of this for your own notes when you get the Arabic, number 11. Okay, this is the ayah in Surah Maryam, ayah number 65 in Surah Maryam. If you want to decode these ayat, you're going to have to learn your Arabic numbers, right? So you're going to have to do a Wikipedia on your Arabic numbers so you practice learning your Arabic numbers, inshallah. There'll be a benefit in that for you. Okay, this is the ayah I want you guys to focus on. رَبُّ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ وَمَا بَيْنَهُمَا فَاعْبُدْهُ وَاسْتَبِرْ لِعِبَادَتِهِ هَلْ تَعْلَمُ لَهُ سَمِيًّا SubhanAllah An ayah that covers the three kinds of tawheed in only one line and it covers them in order one by one by one Lord of the heavens and the earth and whatever is between them This is Lordship so worship him and remain patient in his worship. This is worship. Do you know anyone who has his names and attributes? Do you know anyone who is like him? This is? Asma'u Sifat. Ya Salam. MashaAllah. We have an ayah. We have many ayahs. But this ayah is short and easy to remember. Maryam 65. And uh, Surah Maryam is the 19th Surah of the Quran. So, 1965. Everything you need. Lord of the heavens and the earth, whatever is between them, worship him, remain patient in his worship. Do you know anything that is like him? You have lordship, worship, names and attributes. And then the people say to us that this was invented by some of your scholars. SubhanAllah. So this is one of the clear answers to their claims. Um, we're out of time now, inshallah ta'ala, we're going to go to questions. So next week what we have to do is two, uh, a couple of things. Uh, one of the things we want to do is to talk about the word Tawheed in the Sunnah. Because one of the things people will say is, this word Tawheed hasn't got any basis in the Sunnah. Okay, so let's just uh, make a little note here. The word Tawheed in the Sunnah. We shouldn't have a problem with the word Tawheed because the word Tawheed is a term anyway. You can call it whatever you want. You can call it, you know, uh, Lordship, Worship, Names, whatever you, whatever you want to call it. But the, there shouldn't really be an issue with the word Tawheed. But of course, Ahl Bid'ah. Because they don't have anything to argue with, and because their, their religion is so weak and so deficient in every single way, they're going to try and get you with everything they can. And one of the things they're going to try to get you on is to say to you, the word Tawheed was never said by the Messenger of Allah This Tawheed that you people say is so important, so important, Tawheed, 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 and the Messenger of Allah said, never said the word. We say, SubhanAllah. First of all, the Prophet ﷺ spoke about Tawheed in nearly every hadith, whether he used the word or not. And second of all, we're going to prove to you, inshallah, next week, that the word Tawheed was used by the Prophet ﷺ in more than one hadith. Okay? And then, inshallah, next week, we're going to talk about uh, a, a part of the division of Tawheed. We're going to talk about the statements of the Salaf, rahimahullah, rahimahullah. I'll give you one just to give you, you know, just to give you something to sort of whet your appetite. Al Imam Abu Hanifa and Nu'man ibn Thabit and Mutawaffa Sanat 150. Al Imam Abu Hanifa, Rahimahullah, and Nu'man ibn Thabit, Rahmatullahi alayhi, who died 150 years after the Hijrah, said in Al Fiqh Al Absat, and the page number is there for you. This is why I gave you the Arabic. The page number is there, the reference is there. 
والله يدعى من أعلى لا من أسفل لأن الأسفل ليس من وصف الربوبية والألوهية في شيء. And if you got that, those notes there, just for the guys. Uh, Inshallah, we we'll go over next week as well. I want you to underline the words rububiya and uluhiya because here we have Abu Hanifa rahimahullah using the words uluhiya and rububiya. It appears that Abu Hanifa was a Wahhabi, subhanAllah. He's using the words uluhiya and rububiya. He says, Allah is called upon fil a'la. Allah is called upon above. Allah is above the heavens. Notice he didn't say Allah is in every place. Allah is called up, not below. Because anything which is on this earth is, has no aspect of rububiyya, nor does it have any aspect of uluhiyya. So here we have Abu Hanifa affirming tawheed of rububiyya and tawheed of uluhiyya. And Abu Hanifa died 150 years after the Hijrah, rahimahullah ta'ala. So he affirms that Allah is above the seven heavens, and he says that is because being above is an attribute of Tawheed al rububiyya and it is an attribute of Tawheed al rububiyya Of course, just to give you a heads up, if you show this to some of the people of Bidah, they will simply say, this is not from Abu Hanifa, this book is invented. It's not his book. You say to them, what delil do you have that this book is not his book? They say, because he says that Allah is above the heavens and Abu Hanifa would never say that. So this is their delil that this is not Abu Hanifa's book, despite finding the book attributed to Abu Hanifa by his students and finding the book with manuscripts written, they will still say that it's not his book because they will say, how can it be his book when he talks about Rububi and Uruhida? SubhanAllah. Ali, alhamdulillah, yani, one, whoever Allah blinds, you can't make him see. So that's just an example of what we're going to do next week. We're going to go through 15 or so individuals from the pious predecessors who affirmed to Eid al-Uluhiyya or Rububiyya or Ismail Sifat as it was and they, did, they were not you know, uh, people who lived in the very early ages of Islam. So inshallah we're proving that this division of Tawheed was not something invented by Muhammad bin Abdul Wahab rahimahullah nor by anybody else but it's something found in the Quran and found in the speech of the companions and the speech of the Salaf al-Salih rahimahullah Okay, uh, we've got a couple of questions written ones, I'll deal with those first The first question can you pray in a house that has so-called pictures of Ali radiallahu anhu? Um, I think obviously the, 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 the concern here is that if this is someone's house, where else are they going to pray? You know, like for example, if, I mean, if this is somebody's house that they live in, and especially a sister, then she's going to have no choice but to just try to uh, clean out her room of these pictures and pray in her room. And what Allah has made absolutely haram is to pray in a house that was built for the worship of Ali. Not a house that happens to have the pictures in. If the house happens to have the pictures in, your salah in it is valid. And even though it's best not to pray there, if you can avoid it, if you have somewhere else, but your prayer is valid there. Your prayer is not valid in a place where uh, there, there is, or your prayer is, uh, is not supposed to be offered. And we'll say not supposed to be offered in a place where it was built for the purpose of shirk. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, In Surah Tawbah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Do not ever stand in it. A masjid that is built upon the fear of Allah is more deserving for you to stand in. So this ayah is a, is a fundamental principle in the impermissibility of praying in a masjid that is built for shirk. As for a masjid that just happens to be run by a particular group, um, and uh, you know it wasn't built for the purpose of worshipping other than Allah, then it's, you can pray in it, inshallah, if you need to. Even if you, you know, it's better not to, but you can pray in it if you need to. But a masjid that was built for the sole purpose of calling people to worship other than Allah, this is the masjid that you are not allowed to pray. Verses in Surah Yusuf, 
where Yusuf tells the people with him in jail that judging is only for Allah in Surah to, uh, in Surah uh, and in Surah at Teen, the last verse. Couldn't this be classed as a separate verse? This is what we call Tawheed al hakimida And this is a classification which is Baqir al Khabis. As Ali radiallahu anhu said. And if you want the dalil that this hadith, that this classification is not allowed in Islam, we have to only to look at the statement of Ali radiallahu anhu. Kalimatu haqqin urida bi urida biha batin. Some people came to Ali radiallahu anhu and they said to Ali, O oh Ali, judging is only for Allah. Why did they, what were they intending by this? They were intending to make takfir of Ali, to declare Ali a kafir because he agreed to make a peace treaty with Muawiyah. And because he agreed to make a treaty with Muawiyah, they said judging is only for Allah and you have judged in a, a way which is not in accordance to what Allah has commanded you and Muawiyah has judged in a way that was not in, 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 in accordance with what Allah has commanded you and so you are a kafir and Muawiyah is a kafir. And Ali turned to them and he said, what you have said is true and what you want by it is falsehood. So Ali said, what? What you have said is true. So what is said is true. Allah is the only one who has the right to, to, uh, to legislate. But making it a separate category for the purpose of declaring people out of Islam, and that's the purpose of the categories of Tawheed. Why do we just separate Rububi and Uluhiyah? Why don't we just say Tawheed? Because then we can say, you don't follow Uluhiyah, therefore you're not a Muslim. That's the purpose of it. So the purpose of making a fourth category is in order to say to people, you're not a Muslim because you don't rule by what Allah has revealed. We say to them exactly what Ali radiallahu anhu said, كَلِمَةُ حَقٍ أُرِيدُ أُرِيدَ أُرِيدَ بِهَا بَعْتِ This is a truthful thing you have said, it's true that, judge, that legislation is only for Allah, but you want to cause corruption by the state. So we say to the question, Jazakallah khairan, we don't make a fourth category, and there is ijma' of the people of Ahlul Sunnah wa Jama'ah, that we don't make a fourth category called Tawheed al hakimiyyah and that the right of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to legislate uh, is a part of Tawheed already, and we don't need to emphasize another part. And we don't need to declare people to be kafir because they allegedly rule by other than what Allah has revealed. Rather, the ruling by other than what Allah has revealed, we're going to talk about later. Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, kafirun. Whoever doesn't rule by what Allah has revealed is a disbeliever. Then it is that as Ibn Abbas said, kufrun duna kufr. It is disbelief, but it doesn't make them a disbeliever. Um, it is kufr, which is less than the kufr that takes you outside of Islam. And yeah, I mean, this is an issue which people use to misguide the people a lot, so be careful of it. If you hear somebody declaring the rulers to be kuffar because he says, وَمَنْ لَمْ يَحْكُمْ بِمَا أَنزَلَ اللَّهِ فَأُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الْكَافِرُونَ Say to him, Ya Akhi al Karim, you have just made takfir upon yourself. Say to him this. If you hear someone say, whoever doesn't rule by what Allah has revealed, it is those who are the disbelievers, and he uses this to make takfir of someone, say, Ya Akhi, Jazakallah Khair, you have just declared yourself a kafir. Shukran lak. How have you declared yourself a kafir? Because you have not ruled by what Allah revealed by applying this ayah to these people. And this ayah is general. And the ruling of tafsir is a general ayah is to be applied to everybody. Why do you apply this ayah to the ruler? Why don't you apply it to yourself? So the brother who doesn't, who shaves his beard, kafir, because he is ruled by other than what Allah has revealed. And the person who, when their children come to them and say, oh, daddy, you know, she did this, she did that, and you give favor to one, kafir, khalas, you've left Islam. Chop off his head. Because you've just ruled by other than what Allah has revealed. So the point is that this ayah, if you take it like this, there would not be a Muslim left, wallahi, on the face of the earth. And by making this ayah like this, and by making takfir of people based on this ayah, the very person themselves has ruled by other than what Allah has revealed. So they themselves are guilty of kufr as much as the person who they are accusing is guilty of kufr. So we say, yes, a person who, reveal, who, who rules by other than what Allah has revealed has become, has, is guilty of kufr. But like Ibn Abbas said, it is a kufr that does not take you outside of Islam. 
with conditions unless they declare ruling what Allah has been ruling by other than the Sharia to be halal. Anyone who says it's halal to rule by British law, it's halal to rule by democracy, it's halal, they're kafir mutat. You don't, and this ayah can be applied to them. But as for the person who is judging between his two kids and you know, he gives one an extra sweet to the other, he's not kafir. And even though he has ruled by other than what Allah Azza wa has revealed. And as for applying this to political situations and countries instead of individuals, there's no dalil for this in the ayah. Because the ayah is general, wa man. And the word man is general for every single man, woman, and child. Every child above puberty. Whoever doesn't rule by what Allah has revealed, they are the disbelievers. So inshallah, we take the ayat according to the tafsir of the Salaf al-Salih, and we don't make a fourth category called Tawheed al hakimiyyah Jazakumullah khairun, wa Do we have anyone with any last question? We have one question, inshallah, if you have anyone with any important questions. What the Habib? The word Kursi in Ayat is Kursi. And what is the word mean? The word Kursi. Kursi means, uh, okay. Kursi has three meanings. Okay? Three meanings. Linguistically, Kursi in Arabic means a chair. Okay? Hala Kursi. This is a chair. Okay? Kursi in Ayat al Kursi means the throne of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But when the arsh is mentioned with the kursi, kursi means the footstool. So when the arsh is mentioned with the kursi, then kursi means the footstool and the arsh is the throne. But in ayatul kursi, uh, specifically, from what I recall, and Allah Azza wa Jal, uh, knows best, the ayah is referring to the throne of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And again, in this, we go back to the tafsir of the salaf, we go back to the tafsir of uh, the pious predecessors and they understood and how ayat al kursi was explained um, and even though the kursi is the footstool then in this ayah the kursi is the throne and the kursi can be used for a throne or a footstool inshallah in Arabic and generally kursi means a chair okay does that make sense okay Allahu Alam last question uh, if a Muslim so called Muslim becomes a police officer uh, or into the British army and bows down and makes an oath to the queen, and because that's con that's contradicted to what Allah has said, don't make Allah allies to uh, mm -hmm. the kafir. Mm -hmm. uh, does that mean that they are kafir because they bowed and made an oath to the queen that is other than Allah? Okay, the brother asked a very good question, and he said that somebody who makes an oath to the queen and agrees to join the police force or the army are they kafir? Okay, in this, inshallah, we're going to answer, let me just check, because I'm sure I included it in the course materials, Jaded. We're going to answer it when we talk about shirk and kufr here. So, beginning of next lesson, inshallah, we're going to talk about exactly this issue. Not everyone who commits an act of kufr is a kafir. There are conditions and impediments, including knowledge, ignorance, <coughs> intention, error, freedom of choice, compulsion, clarity, and confusion. Okay, so we're going to talk about these things. Broadly, I'll give you a quick answer. If he believes it's permissible to do this, he's Catholic. In the sense, if he believes it's permissible to, and he says, it's perfectly fine for me to, not the police, I'm talking about in general, like he makes an oath to support the disbelievers, and he says, there's nothing wrong with me, you know, there's nothing wrong with me fighting against Muslims, there's nothing wrong, it's completely halal, he's Catholic. But if he does so for other reasons, worldly reasons, or mistakes, or confusion, or he doesn't know, or he doesn't think that's true, then he's not Kafir. And we're going to talk about this through the issues of knowledge, ignorance, intention, and error, and uh, freedom of choice and compassion. Last, last one. Some sects still simply pretend they are Ahl Sunnah wa Jama'ah. How do we deal with such people in terms of a class setting where they cause fitna in class? Every sect uh, claims to be Ahl Sunnah wa Jama'ah. Every sect claims to be Ahl Sunnah. There's no sect who says, we are not Ahl Sunnah, maybe the Shia. But yani, in general, Ahl Sunnah is a beautiful name, so everybody wants it. You know what I mean? Everyone wants to be Ahl Sunnah wa Jama'ah. And inshallah, I think the answer to that in a classroom setting is you deal with them with hikmah. You don't need necessarily to start a war, you know, but you deal with people, deal with people in the best way. Explain to them. Try to clarify. Try to guide people. Because guiding people is better than cutting them off. If you can guide the person, then this is a blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala.
And if they're causing fitna, then the main thing is you explain the truth. You have to only deliver the truth. That's all we have time for, inshallah. Jazakumullah khairan barakullah fikum. Subhanakallah wa bihamdik shalala ilaha illa astaghfirullah wa tuhu. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.